Okay, guys, before we jump into the podcast, use your reminder, if you haven't already, to sign up to our game-changing weekly e-letter. It goes out to hundreds of men all across the world on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Just hit the link in the show notes or be um, slightly more inquisitive and go and find it on our website, wholemanacademy.com, and sign up and start getting our content as soon as humanly possible. Right, let's jump in. Whole Man Academy. Because the world needs strong men. Whole Man Academy is changing the game for men around the world. It's for guys who want to live an epic life of fun and adventure, no matter what. We believe deep down, all men want to go on their own hero's journey to becoming resilient, confident, fearless, and fulfilled. Listen in to be inspired by guys who don't settle for living a life of mediocrity. This is your call to action and call to adventure. Are you ready? Okay, so this is the Whole Man Academy podcast, episode 116. My guest today is David Key, Amazon number one best-selling author, award-winning coach, principals teacher, which we'll get onto, NLP trainer, master trainer of hypnosis, and also a friend of mine. David, how are you and where are you? I'm really good. And I'm in my garden. I'm actually not in the garden. I'm in the shed at the end of the house. This is my place now. This is uh, where I get my quiet time and um, have conversations like this. Love it. Isn't it important? I know you've got kids and we know that kids uh, and much of anything else are unpredictable with their noise and everything else. So um, what has it been like for you? Because we spoke, um, the previous podcast, some of the guys we listened to was April 2020. And nothing, it really? Really, nothing really has happened since then, of course. Nothing it's, much, no. Uh, it's been quite. So we're going to jump into a lot of that today because I think, you know, it's a perfect time to, to speak to you about this stuff. Um, but mm. at what point did you move into the, let's call it the um, the room at the end of the garden? Um, well, I had a, so I started off working at home 20 years ago as a coach, um, <clears throat> but I still had my corporate mentality with me. So I decided that, oh, I need an office and desks and have to get in the car and drive to this place to do work. You know, I was still in that mindset. So that was in 2000 and um, 2006 mm. that I had offices. Then we moved because it was at the beginning of the last recession. <clears throat> so I rented my flat out, had kids, got offices. And then when the recession sort of sort of died down and things were on the on the return, I decided we're going to buy a family home and I bought this. <clears throat> then I looked at my expenditure on rent and I had a space and a friend of mine is a builder and he said, hey, Dave, you know, you've got beautiful views out there. I'm looking over in farmers fields. Why do you want to get in your car and go in the office? Why don't I build you one? I'm like, you can build me one. He said, yeah, I'll knock those fences down. So you'll have an aspect over the fields and we'll build a shed. Heating, lighting, electric, internet, cost me about 10 grand. I have saved hundreds of thousands of pounds in not having to pay rent. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. So yeah. 2010 was when I moved here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was a bit of a godsend in the pandemic because I could retreat from homeschooling, be in my space <laughs> and um, get creative as opposed to being stuck in the house. I was very fortunate. You, you just said about, I mean, using the word escape, but that's what we saw with a lot of guys and and still now who are struggling with being forced to work from home by their companies. Mm. They were saying, you know, there's always going to be positives and negatives of all these different situations. But, you know, some of the guys we've seen and are still seeing are, are finding it great because, you know, you don't have to commute. But, of course, they're missing out on the so social aspect of actually going into the office. I wondered how how do you... Get through that i know you play a bit of golf so you see your friends but i think it's one of those things where i don't think we'll realize the true impact of it maybe for i don't know how many years on on especially men who are used to being in the office with other groups of men talking nonsense having a laugh a bit of banter mm. yeah it's um yeah so human contact is extremely important right we know that and zoom doesn't really do it i mean we're having a conversation it's great but we got to meet last week yeah it's a totally different experience being in the room with people. So I totally understand why people are struggling. I'm very fortunate. I live close to a pub. I don't really drink. Um, I'll have a pint every now and again, maybe after a game of golf or on a hot sunny afternoon outside, pint of cider. But I'm not a real drinker. My father was, uh, he was down the pub every day after work. And that was his time, his quiet time meeting with the guys because he generally worked on his own as well in a, 
in an office on a computer all day. Um, I never really saw the value. And then the pandemic came. I know we couldn't on many occasions go out, but I tell you what, when we were allowed out to sit in a garden six foot away from somebody, I was there. Yeah. So that's like 10 minutes from here. And I've got guys that I know from school. Well, we've known each other for 40, well, I'm 56 next birthday. So, you know, 45 years. Mm. I've known that some of these guys, um, and I just go there because they don't talk work. They talk silly bollocks and it's <laughs> fun. And it's uh, it's a way to recharge and be away. Cause I've got two girls, my wife, um, two female cats. Luckily I bought a dog yeah. a boy in the pandemic. So I've got him as company, but it's not quite the same as being with fellas. So I think it's really important that, you know, we have a circle of friends or acquaintances that we just get to be in their space and um, to sort of um, get away from that work environment, especially if we don't have an external office. Personally, yeah. this is great because I don't take my work home. And literally, I walk out that door and I've forgotten what I've talked about. Yeah, that is priceless. Yeah. Because, I mean, we had the dinner the last time we saw each other. You know, there was the whole Man Academy dinner that evening. And mm. we always get a mix of guys either coming to events or for dinners. But a lot of them say how good it is just to get out and, and just meet new people as well yeah. you know, and have new conversations, new experiences. Mm. Uh, but during that, I'd said that we were going to have you on the podcast and I like to, um, you know, find a few of the guys and ask them questions. So one of the guys was talking about hypnosis. And I know for you, you know, hypnosis is a, uh, a big part of what you've learned and one of your kind of tools in your you know, toolkit, as it were. Yeah. Tell me what it's like. Uh, firstly, where did you learn hypnosis? And then what was it like, especially when you first started doing it? Because it, I know after learning from you, it's a really weird experience to see someone doing something and you're like, shit, it's working. <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of uh, intellectual misunderstanding about what hypnosis is. It's a, you know, so w when did I first get into it? Um, <clears throat> I was in my 20s, actually. I was I was a seeker <clears throat> and um, I was in Liverpool and I had this guy, a friend of uh, my my girlfriend at the time, her best mate's boyfriend. OK, um, he became boyfriend later down the road. I mean, they just started going out. But um, prior to that, I knew Russell and he was a very shy character. He said, why don't we go to a stage show uh, in Blackpool? So I was like, yeah, sure. Hypnosis stage show. Um, so we went for a few beers. I saw this stage show and I saw Russell perform some hypnotic phenomena that I was like, he must be acting. Oh, OK, yeah. He must be acting. He was drinking a pint of vinegar, thinking he was drinking a Coke. He ate an onion, thinking it was a beautiful peach. He started commanding the stage, thought he was a hypnotist. At one point, the hypnotist hypnotized him to say, when you wake up, you will own this stage and you are the you know you're the hypnotist for the day and you're gonna run and you're gonna do a show with the audience yeah 500 people in the room shy russell you know <laughs> didn't at the time that we went he wasn't going out with maria so he hadn't had a girlfriend had no confidence didn't have the courage to go up and speak to somebody and say do you fancy a drink yeah or anything like that um and yet here he was on stage commanding the audience saying right okay we're going to do a hypnosis show this is i'm russell this is the russell lynch hypnosis show i'm like what on earth is this guy doing how where's he getting all these words from he brought people out of the audience he was doing these amazing things and he was in a trance while he was doing it so when he came back at the end of the show um we were like were you acting yeah. so what are you talking about no then what you just did you were drinking vinegar eating an onion going around the whole venue, talking to every woman that you could meet, asking them if they wanted a drink, because that was one of the suggestions the hypnotist gave him. Right. And then at the end, he kept you on stage after everybody went back in their seats after having their, you know, wacky races and pretending they were driving super formula cars whilst they're sitting in their seats. We've all seen the stuff on telly, right? Yeah. And Russell, you know, I, I'm like, but at the end, you just stood on stage for 20 minutes and did a stage show in hypnosis. You've never been trained. You don't even know what it is. And he's like, what are you talking about? I went, well, what you just did? He went, I didn't do that. Right. He had no <laughs> recollection, which is a hypnotic phenomena. Everybody listening to this. Yeah, well, it, it is. I mean, some people would say it might be dementia, but I mean, it's literally he 
did not have any recollection. Now, obviously, I've been on a journey since that time. Uh, in 1996, I started with a Harley Street hypnotist because after seeing Russell do that, I thought, I've got to learn me that. That's I was profound. And I was hooked. And um, obviously, now I know there are a number of different hypnotic phenomena that human beings experience themselves throughout their lives. And hypnosis is just self-hypnosis. It's it's like, <clears throat> technically speaking, there shouldn't be the term hypnosis. Right. It's um, the hypnotist is almost like a guide. And the person who goes into trance, like Russell, just followed some instructions and using his own neurology, altered his state of consciousness to the point where he had one of the hypnotic phenomena, and that is amnesia. Now, everybody watching this has had a, an experience of amnesia, you know, forgetting. Yeah. Where they forgot, you know, you hear a record on the radio driving to work. And, oh, I love this song. What was it? What's the name again? Mm. Oh, I know this. I know it. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, when they're at work, sitting at their workstation, tapping an email, like, oh, I remember the song. It comes to you. Well, that's an example, yeah, of amnesia, where we know something and we forget. So part of hypnosis is to induce amnesia. And the, re the reason we want to induce amnesia, we want to make um, use universal experiences in our language, like everybody watching this right now has had an experience where they walked into a room and didn't even know why they were there. Yeah. And then they go, yeah, that's true. I don't know. And then I go, forgetting is easy. You forget. You've forgotten. Yeah. And I know there's been a time in your life where you had a dream and you woke up from that dream and you remember part of it. And then a matter of moments later, whoosh, gone because mm. forgetting is easy so what you do is you in hypnosis you're giving examples that are what we call universal experiences that everybody's had which in of itself to remember something that you've forgotten or an experience where you've forgotten induces amnesia it's quite profound why would you want to do that because you don't really want somebody who's experiencing hypnosis with maybe overcoming a challenge for say from in a therapy context yeah. let's say they've got a every time they hear a sound they freak out or every time they see a tomato they feel sick you know some people have phobias of tomatoes or baked mm -hmm. beans or spiders and airplanes and you know the everyday human experience that's so intense that they don't want to feel that anymore yeah so when you work with them you're inducing amnesia they go into a trial with their eyes open a lot of the time because a lot of people think hypnosis is real sleep it's a different type of sleep. It's called nervous sleep, which is the translation of hypnosis, nervous sleep. And you're aware of everything. You hear everything. You feel experiences. But what seems to happen is that the person's conscious mind, their ego, their intellect, the part of them that knows everything that doesn't really. We give that something to do in hypnosis. So that gets out of the way. And then what you're left with is a, like a gateway. Mm -hmm. into the person's unconscious mind and the definition of un unconscious mind is your unconscious mind and this is hypnotic in its of itself your unconscious mind is the part of your mind that you're not conscious of right now here we go uh, what yeah yeah seriously and then they go into trust so um when you induce amnesia loops, like little stories about forgetting, you know, you've walked into a room and you put your keys down and then five minutes later, it's like, it's gone. Where are my keys? You know, or you've been to a party and introduced to someone and given their name and five seconds later, it's like, shit, what was their name? Yeah, I've done that so much. Yeah. So that that is a natural human experience, amnesia. So by inducing that when someone's gone into a trance, then when you make suggestions like the next time you see a red tomato, you're just going to feel an overwhelming sensation to laugh out loud. And you'll have no reason. You'll have no idea why. And that's OK. And you repeat it over and over and over and over and over again. A bit like some of the conversation we might have later and some mm. of our institutions. Yes. Using hypnosis over those last couple of years. Mm. And so by giving amnesia suggestions and they go, oh, I've forgotten. And then you give them suggestions about next time you see a tomato that you, you used to freak out at. That's a suggestion, used to, putting it in the past, in their oh, mind. Yep. Saying, you'll see an orange tomato and you'll just have a, an overwhelming sensation of hysterical laughter wash over you. And you, the more you resist, the harder it'll become to resist. So 
you're putting in suggestions over and over again. It's repetition. You just repeat, you mm. repeat, repeat, repeat. Whilst the critical faculty, their logic and reasoning has left the room, their conscious mind, or you give their con or you create confusion, which we'll talk about. Yep. Once you have confusion, the intellect goes, ah, oh, you know, sod it. Give up. I I'll give up. Can't track this. And then you human beings take on the suggestions. And with amnesia, when they come out of trance, they don't remember. So they don't unpick the suggestion. Uh -huh, okay. So it sticks. I find this, and like we said, we'll we'll get on to more of this, but so interesting because also my other question was about, and I had this conversation at the dinner the other night, are certain people more <laughs> susceptible to hypnosis than others? And if so, how are you, if someone comes to see you, let's say, whether you're still yeah. speaking other and says, Dave, I need help because I don't want to get on an airplane or something. Yeah. Are you able to do things where you go, do you know what, it's not for you, or are you like, yep, yeah, we can do it? Um, no, because I know every human being, without exception, no matter what you think. Oh, I can't be hypnotized. You'll never hypnotize me. I normally get that one down the pub. Go on, Dave, prove it. Yeah, go on. <laughs> uh, often I'll just go to shake their hand and put their hand in front of their face and they're like this for half an hour and everyone laughing at them. You know, it's called a rapid uh, rapid induction. Right. Do you know what? I'm going to ask you about that because <clears throat> I've seen you do it. And obviously <clears throat> the person that maybe think about hypnosis might think of the you know, slow talking and counting or, you know, tick tock of a clock and what yeah. have you. I've seen you do that. Whereas you say, it's like you go to shake someone's hand and you just lift their hand up their face and you're like, done. And you're like, what the fuck just happened? It's called a pattern interrupt. So human beings are walking around with programs unconsciously that run automatically. Someone puts their hand out. You don't even think about it. You automatically go to shake hands, especially guys, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not saying ladies don't do that, but you know what I mean? This is yeah. a, a, a guy's chat. So when we shake like a man's son, so <laughs> and then at school, we play that game, don't we? You put your hand out and took it out. And we're like that. <laughs> you know the one. Well, yeah. there's an example. And you've left your childhood mate in the middle of the playground for a second. It's in that second where you've interrupted an automatic program by not putting your hand out, but you got to put it out and take it away. And in that one second or half a second, the person's brain gets confused. Conscious mind goes, what the fuck? And in that second, you say sleep and the conscious, the unconscious mind goes, I, I know that one. <laughs> and then they go. So it'll take something that. that it understands because you've created confusion. It's, uh, you see it in lifts, you know, people get in a lift, they look up, because that causes trance, looking up at the numbers, count, and they're going down, five, four, three, and the lift stops, and the doors open, they get out, because it's automatic, and then they turn around and go, shit, it's not my floor, and then they get back in. <laughs> yeah. like, there's another example of an everyday, natural, occurring experience where we do it automatically. And if a hypnotist interrupts that automatic program, it's like a glitch in the matrix. Yeah. It's like that moment of confusion. And you give the client something that they can grab hold of, something that they 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 know. And that generally is the command to sleep. It's it's so interesting because I remember when I saw you <clears throat> um what's the word demonstrate it, and you would have, I think it was Dawn Lady, but you know, like basically be kind of with head on a book and feet on a chair yeah and pretty much like you feel like you're levitating and, and i could see myself fairly straw with my con core but there's no way i could do that so you knew it had to be you know there was something in it you and can it, try it you yeah. can try and do that consciously lying across two chairs and then physically tense your whole body and see how long you can stay there and i could take the unfittest person in the room probably me okay with an unengaged core although i'm working on it yeah. And um, put me against you, and I'll beat you every single day of the week if you did it consciously. Yeah. Um, because when someone goes, like Dawn, in that experience that you attended, she go, went into a, I did a rapid induction, and then I gave a suggestion to go stiff and rigid. Now, for some guys, that could be really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> We're not just for a couple of minutes. <laughs> exactly. I've had many a client come to me with that challenge, didn't you? you can create a hypnotic suggestion in their mind that every time they experience the desire and the need to get stiff as a board, then they push the button inside their head that goes on. Sounds like we've got a new product, Dave. <laughs> Turn on. <laughs> so 
Um, yeah, so Dawn I did a rapid induction, and then while she's in a trance like this, standing by the chairs, I put the two chairs out, and then I do what we call ambiguous touch. Right. Now, um, where in hypnosis there's ambiguous language, which causes trance, and you can also do what we call ambiguous touch, which overwhelms the conscious mind and people go stiff and rigid. It's called full body catalepsy, where 600 plus mu muscles in the body go rigid. Okay, this used to be a, um, a phenomena hundreds of years ago called hysterical paralysis, where people literally couldn't move their arms and they were, they said it was hysterical paralysis. It's just they were in a trance and they had full rigidity in their muscle group. Hmm. Now, an, an everyday experience of that, because remember, hypnosis is all. Every day, everybody has been hypnotized, and I'll come back to the suggestibility thing. Um, for guys, uh, a universal experience is going down the pub mm. and watching the match, and your team's about to score, and there's 30 seconds left, and it's like a draw, and he's like, Come on, come on, and you're standing there, and you've got your pint in the air, and you're looking up the screen, Come on, and you forget that your arm's still in the air, right? Yeah. Rigid. Yeah, you're not, you don't even know your hands in the air. That's an example of arm catalepsy. There are people back in the day that used, um, well, we're talking about World War II mm -hmm. in Germany and a gentleman by the name of Adolf Hitler using full arm catalepsy as a way, and now whether he did this knowingly or not, I have no idea. Yeah, it was interesting that people doing the Zika salute that causes trance. Yeah, and then you can give suggestions about doing things that you wouldn't normally do consciously. You see, right. I see how it fits in mass hypnosis. It's being used all around us, um, well, and uh, fascinating. I, I, I love these because it's such a again. I always say we could talk about morning routines and strength conditioning and blah blah, blah all the time, but getting into the deeper stuff of psychology. Um, you know, I always want guys to listen to the podcast and I would say you could listen to an hour, but if there's one thing that you go light bulb moment, you know, yeah. these kind of things, being aware of what's around you. Yeah. And I know you and I spoke before, but, you know, I, I noticed very early on, not because I'm an expert, because I listen to people that hmm. during like the lockdowns that, you know, the messages that were being put out were basically psychologically manipulating people. And I remember it was Sage who, you know, many of us will know, but they had a document which was presented to Sage calling for an increased perceived threat, um, you know, mm. using hard hitting emotional messages. Mm. And I just wanted for you, like, at what point did you see that and think, hold on a minute, because we see the hands, face, space, you know, the mm. suggestions of three different mm. things like that. Um, you know, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. It Get was all boosted the, now. That's it. All the now, three. now. Yeah being a modal operator and it's yeah. time related now in the moment right. it's a suggestion we use it in hypnosis close your eyes now three words get boosted now so we're governments using psychological te tactics techniques strategies of course they were i mean you can go back to barack obama if you like and google on the internet barack obama um hypnosis and one of his great speeches he gave in germany he was using three words change we can yes i remember now which is linguistically if you look at that change what, what change what specifically do you mean by change yeah when you say we who's we is that just the american people is it just who is it so change yeah. ambiguous we ambiguous now or no, can, modal and, operator right. of possibility. Well, if you've got no specifics or details around that, you're going to fill in and make something up. Change we can. Yeah, I need a better job. So I'm going to vote for Barrett. So you put your own mm. story around that. Is it the fact that it also doesn't actually make sense, does it? I mean, no time in your own life, I would guess, of any man listening, and they'd be like, yeah, you know, like, right, change we can. And you'd be like, what? But yeah. it's like it confuses you as well as having some, some level of suggestibility. Get Brexit done. Yes. Hands face space. Get boosted now. Yeah. It's hypnosis. 
Yeah. They're using hypnosis. I, I know of specific experts in this field that write speeches for people in government, or they have done in the past. I don't know if they're doing it now. I've read those speeches. I've used them in our master practitioner of NLP modeling assignments. You know, um, there's one case of one politician who's no longer a politician, although he's involved still in influencing governments, mm. that wanted to have a standing ovation that was longer than Margaret Thatcher's when she did her last Conservative Party conference. This particular politician wasn't conservative. And he paid a bonus to the scriptwriter as if his audience stood for more than <laughs> her last talk. Isn't that interesting? There's a big ego there. Yeah. I want a standing ovation that was longer than Margaret Thatcher's. Like, great. So, you know, his opening statement. Yeah. As we stand here today, I mean, for fuck's sake, it's <laughs> like, it's so obvious if you know what's going on. I was going to say, if you can look behind the curtain and see what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. I, so on that, I remember going out to um, the Tony Robbins event in Miami, which was Date With Destiny. Um, yeah. And it was the year before they filmed I Am Not Your Guru. <laughs> right. Um, which is really interesting. And one of his coaches was a lady who I'd uh, employed to have, or I got sessions with her through the whole package and she was great. But what she would do, because she knew I was interested in the behind the curtain stuff, mm. which she'd get me out on the side of the, the room and she'd say, Tony's going to do this now and the music's going to come now and he's going to touch them on the shoulder and he's going to... And I realised, I don't mean to say in a negative way it was scripted, but it was a performance. It was fucking mind-blowing. Yeah, I realise there's so much to it that can be done with the way that you can be manipulated to have a have a feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, all Tony's doing or any hypnotist is utilising what's already there. Mm. See, all human beings have experienced something in their lives that creates feelings and there will be a memory of it. And then you can use certain words that will trigger the memory and bring back that feeling for them. Yeah. So everybody can go into their minds now and imagine a time when they felt really, truly loved. And if, as they imagine that experience, imagine being there then now in their mind, seeing what they're seeing, hearing what they're hearing and feeling the feelings as if they were there then now. And, um, oh, my gardeners have arrived. If you can hear a buzz, forgive me, but I'm not going to tell them to stop. All right, carry on. <laughs> yeah. So, so... Tony is using the, the, the art and science of using language in a way that gets people to feel a certain way to their advantage or to his advantage. Now, you know, I remember my wife saying to me once, she said, oh, if I'm so glad you don't use your skills for evil, you know, <laughs> trying to like keep me grounded, you know. Yeah. Oh my God, I changed this person's life. Yeah, I'm so glad you don't use those skills for evil. Um, which demonstrates that we have as human beings a deep understanding of psychology and hypnosis. They've been using hypnosis in governments going back in the day. I have a book on my shelf there by uh, George H. Estabrooks. It's called Hypnotism. And he wrote it in the 1940s because they were studying orators. Okay. People in government and leaders and Adolf Hitler, and how is it that these individuals can get to get people to do things against their will mm. with hypnosis? Yeah. So, because I just find that so interesting, because then it comes on to the, and you just said, you know, it can be used for good by helping someone overcome a fear mm. or mm. Uh, you know, some kind of block, but also it can be used for evil. And I would suggest that what they've done to people's mental health and what they've done to people's perception of their level of threat around them has mm. been um you know escalated wildly and i know you know i've seen different psychologists and or you know people in that space have kind of accused let's say downing street of using mm. the um uh, covert psychological strategies right. and, and to create that a state of like heightened anxiety and we know how much anxiety Mass formation psychosis i think one yes. One psychologist was talking about right. looking at what the government were doing with their nudge unit. Mm. Um, but governments have been doing this since time began, you know, using fear as a way to leverage behavior. So, like, if I went into a hotel tomorrow and went, fire! Mm. Jesus Christ, everybody would run out of there, right? Because of the fear they would sense, the fear for their life, 
and their behavior would change as a direct consequence, even if there wasn't a fire. Yeah. So, so we know that we can use language and messaging in a way that installs fear, even if it's not true. Mm. The question is, what are the motives of the people advising government? And was there something nefarious going on behind the scenes? I don't know. I, I think a lot of our politicians are so ignorant to that. They just get a script, speech written, they have a meeting, and they this is what you need to do, Boris. Just say these words every day, and it'll, it'll affect people's behavior. Let's create some really confusing messages so people don't know what the fuck, if it's left or right, up or down. Yeah, well, so you they'll just... be in a trance. You're reading my notes because that's exactly my next thing was about the confusion and you know listening to the people I do they'll say if things are deliberately confusing firstly it creates conflict between people because I'll be like well Dave I saw this you know no 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 it said this and and that confuses people and causes issues and also just for yourself because you'll see one message will say one thing and one will say slightly different yeah. And is it that your subconscious or your, your mind is then like, I don't know what the fuck's going on? Well, it's overwhelmed because we can only track a certain amount of information at any one time. And when we get overloaded with mixed messages, it causes the conscious mind to basically leave the room. And then we become um, more suggestible. Because if if people in government, whether they need, let's not get into the nitty gritty of whether the, the COVID and pandemic was a setup or not or whatever, I, I just sit on the fence and go, wow, you know, if you've if you haven't got a cure for the disease, okay, you've got this idea uh, possibilities that this could be a leak from a lab or um, some unknown pathogen that we've never experienced before that seems to be wiping people out within a matter of days, um, and then you have scientists coming in giving you worst case scenarios and you go, Jesus Christ. We need to do something. Well, do this, Boris, or do this, the cabinet. You get these messages out. It's going to create anxiety, yeah, but at least people's behaviours would change and they'll stop kissing each other um, until we got a handle on this. So is that good or not good? Depends on your perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, well, do you know what? And on that, I spoke to, um, there's a, uh, Mm. let's say, journalist, author, writer called Laura Dodsworth, who wrote mm-hmm. the book um, uh, midway through the the kind of, I think the lockdowns, and it was called State of Fear. Right. Um, and she, so I spoke to her at a party in London a while ago and, and told her that it was a really good book. And that had really helped me, like you say, look deeper at the, like, the government documents just to see, and again, taking this, whether you thought it was a good or bad thing, but just realizing how much of it was going on. Um, and, and that was the thing for me, it was about fear, because I know like even with the government, you know, they'll always have their, um, they have their, they have their perceived threat level, which I know is low, moderate, substantial, severe and critical, because I screenshot it from MI5. Right. And um, even now, the threat to the UK from terrorism is substantial, and they put substantially in capital letters, in case you didn't understand what substantial means. But I noticed that the fear level was a low, moderate, substantial, severe and critical. There's never a none. There's always something going on. But I just wanted for you, knowing what you do about the mind, what does fear do to people? It changes their biochemistry. Fear. um, Well, you've heard the saying, some people in, say, in the corporate world or in in, in any world, they're motivated by sticks or carrots. Mm. I used to run a sales team. And some of the chaps and ladies were motivated by deadlines and, and fear of failure. So you could amplify that a little bit. Well, can you imagine what it'd be like if you're the only person who doesn't hit your target? That seemed to work for some. Did that to others who were motivated by carrots? They'd be up and gone. Yeah. So I guess when we're messaging to the public, we've got to incorporate carrots, sticks, um, future paste possible tragic scenarios. So you're building this picture of something that's not real because it's a separate reality. Everybody's in their own reality and everybody's creating their own experience. Um, But fear, um, I remember, so let me sort of talk to that. I did a training, well, I've done so many trainings, but with a guy called Dr. Richard Bandler years and years ago. And someone said, 
why is it why isn't this solution working well i keep offering solutions and carrots to my team he said oh everybody needs a bit of push and pull right everybody needs a carrot and a little bit of stick or more stick and a little bit of carrot and that way you're going to ensure that you're communicating and messaging to everybody's what we call meta programs are you motivated with fear pain or are you motivated with pleasure which would be tony robbins approach everyone's motivated by fear pain or pleasure and everybody's doing their best to avoid pain hence create pain in the in the british public's minds or anybody's minds and they'll do everything they can and move away from it mm -hmm. and then offer them a pizza for an injection you know there's a yep. carrot so um was it necessary or not i i don't know but are people suggestible going full loop back to that question how suggestible are you everybody is mm -hmm. every single person on planet earth now we have a scale in hypnosis and that scale is from z um, zero to 100 percent of the population let's take that as a and we split it into three 20 percent, 60 percent, and 20 percent. so 20 percent of people without any training without any guidance you can get them to drop into deep hypnotic states where you could do open heart surgery wow okay where they you could induce no pain mm -hmm. have their eyes open change their biochemistry cool. their heart rate it's pretty phenomenal 20 percent of the population can go are what we would call somnambulists mm -hmm. sleepwalkers sleep talkers people have a drink maybe only have three or four pints and can't remember anything about the day again Alcohol is a trance-inducing substance. Mm. Alters your neurology, and a lot of people, and people watch this podcast, if anything like the guys that I hang around with, have had an occasion in their life <laughs> where they had a little bit too much and couldn't remember a bloody thing that happened the night before. Well, yeah. what was that? Well, you were hypnotized. That's why you got on stage and were doing pole dancing without any clothes on. Really? I was doing that? <laughs> yes. Oh, Shit, you saw that bit. Yeah. yeah. I was there that night. Yeah. yeah. What happened? Well, you got drunk. Your co conscious mind was so overloaded, it left the room and you went into a, a, a an alcohol-induced trance and performed hypnotic, bizarre hypnotic uh, yeah. behaviors like dancing on stage, slurring your words, not remembering the, the last conversation you had. That's 20% of the population can go there right. without any training. 60% with a little bit of guidance messaging mm -hmm. suggestion and repetition over time will find deep trance we'll be able to go into a deep trance um and then 20 percent find it difficult but they can all go just right. need a little bit more effort so that's why when the government messaging goes out there's a percentage of the population that are awake and going I am working on me. Yeah. I can feel myself going. I keep watching the BBC. What's yeah. happening? Oh my God. Oh, Jesus Christ. I was going into a trance. And they snap out of it. And then they, their critical faculty comes back in and they maybe start questioning and, and chatting. That's, that's where, I mean, we talk about our kids not watching TV mm. um, and certainly not normal TV. Like we'll allow them to watch some stuff where it's, you know, they might be watching how tractors get put together or animals and stuff like that. That's because you live in the, near the farms now, don't you? You're yeah, they're, yeah. they're in, you know, <laughs> two boys and they're interested in machinery and building and stuff. What what a surprise. Um, but with them, it's amazing because I'll walk in and, and, of course, they'll both be sitting there just completely open mouth and in a trance. And mm. I don't think I ever noticed it until I worked with you and read more and learnt that I realised that we all do it. And even with kids' TV, I find myself, if I was sitting there, Emma will bring in, like, a cup of coffee or something and she'll look at me and she'll say something. And I realize that I'm just sitting, you know, I'm not even watching the actual program because it's some kids telly, yeah. but it's the hypnotic nature of the, you know, the, 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 mm. the waves that are coming out. Yeah. Yeah. So you know what happens, uh, all the best film producers and yeah, you know, someone like Steven Spielberg, they understand hypnosis. They know that within the first five to 15 seconds of someone sitting down in their seat at the IMAX will go into a trance. Right. Like Jaws. Here's a prime example. Because um, I was thinking of Steven Spielberg, Jaws the movie, and I, and I wrote about it in Joyride as an example of how the mind works. Now, back in the day, in the 1970s, when the premiere of Jaws was over, on the at the premiere in the States, I can't remember when, in, in LA, I think, 
um, two or three of the audience members passed out right. in the opening sequence of Jaws. Literally got up, oh, I can't watch this, got up, bang, hit the floor, hit the deck, came round, ended up getting um, psychotherapy, psychology, counselling, whatever it might be words you want to use and they were asked the question so what happened oh well, i was sitting in the opening sequence of jaws and uh this girl you just saw a silhouette she took her clothes off you just saw the silhouette of her and she goes swimming in the in the ocean and it was sort of dusk and there was a bell in the distance going bong, mm. bong, and everyone was really silent and then all we all of a had all of a sudden we heard da, 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 da. And the next thing I know, there's blood and guts everywhere. This woman, blah, 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 and she goes under the water, and it was so oh, it was tragic. And this shark came and ate her. This is a prime example of how hypnosis, even in a cinema, can make yourself so scared that you pass out. That's how powerful hypnosis is. Because you see, here's the thing that most people don't actually know. In the opening sequence of Jaws, Steven Spielberg was going to have the shark in it. And it was a mechanical shark. They didn't have CGI in the way they do now. Uh, yep. So they had a robotic shark. And every time they put it in salt water, it broke down. A bit like Tesla's, yeah. A bit like Tesla's, yeah. So, so they had to create this opening sequence and they had no shark. So they used their cinematography and their... They're knowing of how to captivate and hold an audience. There was no blood. There was no shark in the opening sequence. You just saw this silhouette of a woman and then her go under the water. So, so basically... these people that passed out were getting psychology. <laughs> they were they passed out and were getting counselling for something that never freaking happened. Apart so from they've just been in their mind. In their mind, I guess. Right. Well, here's how it here's here's my theory on it. I, I haven't tested this, so I don't know if it's true. But if there was no shark in the opening sequence of Jaws. And they passed out and described seeing blood and guts and this massive shark come up and eat her. What happened? Well, they were standing in the queue at the premiere. And on one of the walls where they advertise what movies come on, there's this big picture of a freaking shark on the clear, in clear blue water coming up to a woman swinging on the top. Yeah. I don't know if you remember the poster for George. Yeah. That's what they imagined. So they hallucinated. Using their minds, they created a separate reality and scared themselves almost to death. I just, I find it fascinating. What it, what it reminds me is, you know, to, to be aware so much of like what you're consuming, even without realizing it around you. Um, I mean, that, you know, that for me, I think in the last, you know, going on to government messaging or even sales, you know, forgetting government messaging, but on sales and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're scrolling Instagram, and of course we know now, our phones are listening to us all the time because you and I know if I talked about camping now, when I turn my phone on, oh, it, it magically listens to it. But you know, when you're when you're scrolling, I always think that's uh, you know not only you being manipulated um, visually, but psychologically, you've got these you know apparatus that are, are listening to you all the time. Mm. Um, but I was going to ask you also about I know you've um, you know I've taken your courses, and the new one for you is the innate well-being uh, practitioner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to tell us about that because I think it's when I was reading about it, I just thought it was such a good way to help more people help more people, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I just cleaned my glasses. OK, so for the last 20, 30 years um, since I got into this um, this field, OK, because I was in IT before that, as you know, worked for the MD of Apple back in the day and he had set up his own business and then I travel around the world. And I was tired of the corporate, a bit like you. And I was like, that's it. I want to get out. I was fascinated with psychology. I'd already trained in hypnosis. And um, one day the company was really struggling. And they said, oh, we can't afford to pay you the tens of thousands we owe you in commissions. Because I was in sales as well. And that they, I agreed that I'd say, if you settle 50% of what you owe me, I'll be gone tomorrow if you want. Because mm -hmm. I was already had my mind on being elsewhere anyway. They agreed. I was like, right. Well, I got in there before they ran out of cash and I'm going to become a coach. So I went and trained in the various other disciplines and um, I ended up, it was never my intention, um, but teaching and training coaches, I guess over the years and to the levels that I've been in, uh, been at, that, that was the natural progression to ultimately go from coach to trainer.
mm. master trainers. So training trainers. Um, and during the pandemic, I launched some of my courses online and attracted about 100,000 students who have invested in one of my programs over the last 24 months, 30 months. And I, I was in America in March and I woke up one morning and went, do you know what? I don't really feel like I'm serving my community to the best of my ability. What did that feel like? Well, that I'm not serving them to the best of my ability. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I hadn't considered it. I was serving the people that were doing my high end programs. Mm. Um, and then I noticed that there was a downward uptake on some of the programs. And I thought this needs to be fresh. I was a bit frustrated, to be honest with you, because a lot of people that join my programs don't complete them. And when we speak to them, it's not because um, they're lazy or anything like that. It's just that how can I say they came to the program not necessarily to be a coach they said they want to be a coach mm -hmm. but when you drill down into it they really wanted to change something about their experience of life right under the auspices I want to be a coach so I decided after speaking with the team that when I woke up in America on holiday at Easter I said to Anne I said I've got to put on an event an event for the people that just do my digital courses because there's there's no proximity they've had no contact with me apart yeah. from emails yeah whereas the people who have invested thousands to be with me they get my time regularly like this in this medium and in training rooms and face to face now that we can do that and it was just a thought and it excited me so at first i was disappointed that people aren't completing their pro or going out and doing coaching a small small portion and then after questioning and, and thinking about it and reflecting i thought i want to change direction mm. i want to move from training coaches to actually teaching anybody guys ladies um anybody yeah. that is interested in transcending their challenges doesn't matter what the challenges are depression anxiety addictions body images uh, issues with their body image um, lack of motivation you say oh i can't get down to the gym to work and be cool well i like, teaching people how the mind really works not concepts yeah not theories or or um models but truth see there's a fundamental difference to between what i used to do with hypnosis and nlp and coaching models and theories and teaching coaches how to do that there's a fundamental difference between that and teaching them the principles behind all of that. Mm -hmm. The principle, the fundamental principles, a bit like if I was building an aeroplane and I was good at building planes and I was teaching people how to, you know, like Meccano, this yeah. is how you build an aeroplane, get in and fly it. If I don't, or if they don't understand the principles behind flight, it ain't going to get off the ground. <laughs> no matter how pretty it looks, if you haven't taken into consideration lift, elevation, thrust, speed, gravity, which is a principle, if you don't understand the principles, then you're really um, you're working from something that's built on sand, like a house built on sand, flaky foundations. OK, mm -hmm. whereas if you understand, hey, there are only three principles behind the human experience. And if you really not intellectually understand but understand through experience through realization then that will change your whole life because everything that human beings experience is a direct consequence of these three principles working in harmony like a trinity mm -hmm. creating the human experience so i decided andy falls the story short i woke up gonna be in service to anybody that buys my stuff anybody whether that be this medium, podcast, radio shows, TV, it doesn't matter what it is, and just share what I know and understand and be in service. And that sort of morphed into, right, running a, an event, which was a couple of weeks ago. I think there was 1,260 people registered. Yep. And at the end of it, I said, look, I'm going in a new direction. I'm creating a certified program. And instead of training you to be a coach, I'm going to be teaching people who join my program how to teach, facilitate, and share this understanding 
to anybody, even if they don't want coaching. Mm. So it could be a team meeting at, I don't know, Credit Suisse right now. They're having a bit of a tough time. Yeah, they're right? going to need it. They're going to need it. They might be stressed out of their minds that day. They don't need coaching. They really need to understand what causes stress. And it's not the current state of the bank and what's going on in their world. It's because of these principles at play. And when people understand that, they become more like Teflon. Mm. They still have the challenges. They still work and experience day-to-day -day life and curveballs and downs and ups. and But they become more like Teflon. Yeah. Because those challenges, they don't, they're, they're not sticky anymore. I'm sure enough guys could do with that. You know, we, we cover in the energy protocol course on one of the weeks is about mindset. And I tried yeah. to, I remember sitting and, you know, I spoke to yourself and John about it, of like how I could give them the, the you know, most bang for your buck of the most simple thing I could that I found that was really effective. Yeah. Because I was trying, you know, um, you know, try and get across to people that if you can get your mindset sorted, hmm. then that's like, the, that's unlocking the door to everything else. Whereas if yeah. you haven't got your mindset sorted, I mean, you, you and I know people that have got loads of money, but are really um, upset about something else in their life. You'll know people that have got no money that are really happy because yeah. they're content with what they've got. Some people it's illness, some people it's job, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, and that's one of the big things is if you can start working on your, your inner self, then mm. hopefully the outer self will start kind of taking care of itself. And see, the thing is that people working on the outer stuff to try and get the inner stuff to feel better. Mm. Okay. That's like pissing in the wind. There's no point. It's a waste of energy, waste of time. You will never, ever experience a joyful life if you're trying to control the outside world to meet your personal expectations and what you think needs to be in place to be happy yeah it's not possible it's impossible mm -hmm. um because that's not how we work this is what's so beautiful about this understanding because i can ask anybody in any field in any doesn't matter who they are how much money they've got what their challenge is they'll bring me a challenge oh can't motivate myself to get to the gym okay what's causing that well i'm so busy at work really that's not the cause the cause is one of the principles are in play you're having a thought you're feeling what you're thinking and you're acting on it or not acting on it you go oh i've got a lot of work i feel stressed i need to sit at my desk no you need to get down the gym and forget about work for five minutes and you just yeah. might find you feel freaking better after it and you'll be able to get the work done because you've not paid attention to what you were thinking mm. so the people that, that so for example like because you're in you're very much into health and fitness and clean living clean eating and i'm sure you get people to come come to you and say anthony like can you hire yeah. me I, I want you to be my coach because i want to go from you know couch to 5k and drop a stone mm. and tone up Sometimes it's one of the guys that approached me just said, he basically said, I just want to look good in a t-shirt because yeah. he knew he was on stage and presented yeah. and you're like, okay, let's dig deeper. So, yeah. yeah. So that that's, so, and I, let me talk from personal experience. So I've been in and out of the gym for years. I used to be fit, young, 20, 30 something, and then got married, <laughs> got a sit down job, ate a lot of donuts, drank a lot. And never really looked after my physical look and feel. I had a go here and there, but mm. I decided because I, since this change in trajectory and 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 saying I want to be in service as opposed to training coaches, um, I've had a lot of opportunities just appear. It's funny when you change your mindset, and I'm thinking, well, if I'm going to be on stage to thirty or thousand people at this particular for this particular opportunity that might come to fruition, I really need to to. Um, look good in a t-shirt <laughs> yeah so 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 for the last three weeks i hired a coach because i think it's a good thing have someone that you're accountable accountable yeah. to and i never had he um he trains people on the mission impossible set so i've only been with him for three weeks dropped seven pounds and now the last what i've had three weeks eight sessions with him in three weeks got another one tomorrow and um he said to me he said have you ever not have you not wanted to come here for any of these sessions i said yeah today i yeah. really didn't want to come here today yeah. at least you're so honest how did you how did you get motivated to do it i went i just fucking ignored the thoughts that i don't want to go <laughs> they ain't real 
yeah. even though I wanted to pay attention to them and I didn't feel like motivated. I felt lethargic. Do you know what? I felt amazing afterwards. So I know now because of this understanding and anybody who gets this understanding that we can get hoodwinked by irrelevant thoughts. And 99% of the thoughts that come into everybody's heads are totally irrelevant. Yeah. Totally irrelevant. If they understood the nature of thought, they could just allow the thought to leave. Now, another one might come, but that's all we ever, ever experience. Human beings only, only experience the feelings of what they're thinking in the moment. And it's not coming from the outside world. That will protect people. It will stop people taking their lives. Yeah. It stop t- people become being too serious because serious, in my view, is an illness. Right. Mm. Um, and it, as I say, um, like, for example, with you or anyone in your community that listens to this or anyone not in our community who's listened to this, so who's in personal development. So my trainer, like, he work, I think he's working with, like, Simon Pegg, you know, Simon Pegg, Mission Possible. And he goes on set with, with someone like Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise has, like, machines there on set with 40 grand resistance that resist both ways. He said, oh, your three sets of 15 dumbbells, Dave, Tom will, you know, um, uh, Tom Cruise will just need to do one set, yes. which is the equivalent of three. And then after that, someone goes, yeah, Tom, have something to eat. So he actually doesn't have to do any thinking and it's all done yeah. for him. Nice if you can be like that. That. But that would be so much easier. Yeah. But I said to him, I said, so what What do you, what's the plan? This is the beginning. He said, well, you know, we're going to track everything that you eat. Everything. Oh, my God. Macro level. Mm-hmm. protein right carbs but you're not on a diet you just, i just want you to eat like you normally eat and then we'll see yeah. <laughs> it makes you more mindful doesn't it to be like hold on a minute i yeah. didn't realize that had zero or loads of protein yeah. and now i can eat more or less of it oh man he, like my protein like i can't eat enough bro I, I'm, I'm chicken yeah I'm protein shape i'm, I'm still only halfway there this is crazy but i'm loving the feeling i've got the energy back in three weeks my heart rate's come down and he said to me he said you seem really inspired and motivated. I said, well, I'm like any other person, but if you don't have solid foundations as someone that you take on as a client, if they don't understand how their minds work and you ask them to fill in a food diary yeah. and then what's your biggest challenge is that people not filling in their food diary. I mean, yeah. If they don't understand how the mind works, they're just going to come up with all the reasons and excuses and you're going to have another failed client. In other words, someone that doesn't achieve their goals. So solid foundations. Deep understanding of your mindset, absolutely. And understanding those three principles that are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, creating that experience. And that, I think for me, is what I've got on offer now to anybody that comes my way, as opposed to going, do you want to be a coach? No, I don't. All right, they're depressed and suffering. That's that's not my thing. Now it is. Well, I know when I you know heard the concept, I was like, it, it, it nailed it also because... I know we said the male female divide maybe for you and and for me and how I see it is a lot of the men that want to be coaches is because they need to provide and they would like a, you know, whether it's a six figure salary or not. But the point is they need a monetary return on it. They might want it to be impactful, but also guess what? They've got bills to pay Whereas Mm. maybe some of the women who are taking it, who also maybe their husbands are at work or have you, Mm. they want it to help people, not necessarily to bring a a revenue Mm. stream in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Looking at the innate well-being, about 70% are women right. at the program. Lot, most of them want to be in service, teaching to children, teenagers. Um, others just have no idea, but would like to take this out into the corporate world. I think this understanding, if it was to spread like, you know, across the UK top, I don't know, 1,000 companies. Mm-hmm. If every CEO, every board of directors really understood how human beings' psychological experience is created via the gift of these three principles of mind, consciousness, and thought, and how they work together, then and then were to disseminate, teach, provide training to all members of the team. doesn't matter what level you're in, what, what role you're in. What you'll find is the performance of that organization will just skyrocket because people won't be suffering with their mental health. 
if they're having a down day, they'll know what's going on because of the, the nature of thought and moods and how the quality of our thinking changes yep. based on um, our level of consciousness. Less time uh, off. Less time off. People will be more creative. People will be happier. The feeling will be great. People will understand their colleagues when they're venting on them. He's fucking having a go at me. Yeah, he's just having a moment. He's just lost in thought. He's just drifted out of his lane a bit. He'll be back on board in a moment, as opposed to taking it personally. Oh, you made me feel bad, which again is, well, you're as bad as the next person because if you think someone else made you feel bad, you've just been hoodwinked. <laughs> you've been hoodwinked by your own thinking because that is an impossibility and it's not how the world works. That's cool. why one person um, can say terrible things to 10 people and two of those people will go, hey, he's just having a bad mood. I'm all right, that, don't me. That's one of the big things with at the moment we're seeing, Dave, is, you know, with censorship. And I know we'll, we'll tie up the interview in a minute because I know you've got stuff to do, but, yeah, you know, sure. how it's that, well, it, that's offended people by saying this or that or uh, an opinion. And again, you realise that, uh, you know, once you've put an opinion out there, it's up to someone else if they want to be offended by it or not. Uh, and all this backtracking we see on Twitter is, oh, I'm really sorry I said that. I'm like, you said what you were thinking in the moment. And if other people are affected by it, it's not your problem. But unfortunately, if you're a celebrity or you're high profile, well, it is your problem because now you've got to deal with all the trolls and the people saying, you made me feel bad. I'm like, well, fucking yeah. hell. Seriously, yeah. if I made you feel bad by something like that, the rest of your life, you're going to be controlled by what other people say. Good luck with that one because you are not going to be happy. That is that's exactly what I wrote about a few weeks ago, where I said, you know, in danger of let's call it the the young guys growing up who are in their teens and twenties. If they think that that they're going to go through life without anything being said to them that they feel is unkind, mm -hmm. and if that happens, they can't handle it, then they're fucked. Because yeah. especially when you work in the city or in sales or anything, you're going to have in life, mate. Right? In life, you know, anywhere you, in life, you cannot control other people. Other human beings will be judging all the time, judgment, opinions, agreement, disagreement, because everybody's living in a separate reality. And what mm. my life experience and my reality and how I think and my world is mine and mine alone, as yours is yours. And if I share something that's going through my mind, like, oh, don't like Andy's shirt, and I, it just happens to pop out of my mouth, or yeah. I don't like his necklace, right? You could be offended or not offended. It's entirely up to you, but it's just my thought, and I just shared it. And some people say, well, you shouldn't share your thoughts. So it's like, which ones? Yeah. Which Please. thoughts shall I not share with you? Because, yeah. like, I don't want to make you unhappy. Now, here's the problem with that. We're, the world is going to be living on tender hooks, walking on eggshells, worried that, oh, if I say this, it will offend that person, and mm. that person will laugh, comedians and jokes. And, I mean, it's like the world, to me, feels like it's lost. Human beings are lost looking in the total wrong direction of what creates their experience. And they go, you made me feel that way. And what they don't realize is when they're pointing, there's always three fingers pointing back at them and they haven't seen that yet. It's like, my boss made me upset. Your boss was harsh. Your boss's voice was loud. He maybe said things to you that maybe society deems to be inappropriate. And you're suffering because of that. Yeah. Well, no, you're not. You're suffering because of all the ideas you have about how he or she should have spoken to you. You're suffering because of the what you're doing inside your mind about what was said. And that's your problem. Nothing to do with your boss. If yeah. you could come to terms with what's happening inside your mind and all feelings are coming just from that, then you're going to do well in life. You're going to transcend problems easily. You'll be more like Teflon. You'll, you'll calm down, your mind will settle. Um, you you'll won't be so, you'll, you're out. yeah, you'll be a pleasure to be around as well. And yeah. you'll be more forgiving of your boss when they have a moment because you'll go, they're lost in thought. Mm. They're reacting to their thinking. They're reacting to my behavior. I did this report and I made a mistake and now they're freaking out. They're not freaking out the mistake I made in the report. They're freaking out because they think they look bad or they're freaking out because they're going, oh, fuck it, oh, what have I got to explain to the board? Because yeah. I told them we were going to hit our target this month and we're 70% off. I feel bad and I'm angry at you. Mm. But they're angry at you because of what they're doing in their head and nothing to do with the report. Do you see what I'm saying there? I'm I pointing think, to. I think that's so much, especially when you talk about in business and, and, and 
kind of one example of that would be what with a couple of the younger guys who would be on Yahoo to different traders. And of course, yeah. they'd have to understand that if a trader just sent back yes or no, it wasn't because they didn't want to say please or thank you. They're being short. Sure, they're fucking busy or they're stressed and maybe they've just lost a load of money. Yeah. But they'd be like, oh, giving one word answers. What a twat. And I'd be like, really? Firstly, yeah. You'd, you'd, would that happen? Like, does that, does it matter? Like he's, he projected the message he wanted in as shorter characters yeah. as he needs to. Yeah. But you'll take offence because he hasn't, you know. What, but what I hear there, Anthony, is let's say this is a true, true person. Mm -hmm. You obviously had that experience. Yeah. So straight away, what I hear is, young lad, set of rules on how he should be spoken to, and someone yeah. else didn't meet the rules. Now I would go to him and say, "Did you tell the trader that's how you want to be spoken to?" Yeah. And they'll go, "No." I said, "Well, no. how the fuck are they supposed to read your mind?" They're not mind readers. This is sort of thing that happens at home in the relationship, isn't it? My wife goes, you're not stacking the dishwasher very well. I'll go, you're getting annoyed at something. I didn't need, what are the rules? Yeah. Well, you've got to put the knives down, not up. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that rule. See, I put them up. Actually, yeah, that's the other way around. She has them up and I put them down. So, <laughs> But yeah. what I'm saying is we didn't come to uh, a state of understanding until we both shared our personal rules for how we stack the dishwasher. Mm. But human beings go all the way around the world with these ideas and stories about how things should be somebody else doesn't meet it like for example in the car um i used to get really road rage now i just think it's quite amusing i don't get affected by that but um you know the other day i don't know someone flashed their lights at the car in front because they probably didn't wave and say thanks for letting me through yeah. and then the person in the car gets in annoyed and starts hooting and sharing and giving the v sign or whatever it is and i'm like hang on a minute so you have a rule of how it should be. Well, shouldn't everybody know that etiquette? Well, they're probably in a trance, like thinking yeah. about work. They didn't even notice you. We, we got such big egos, haven't we? That yeah, you know, everyone should be how we want them to be. This is just good luck with that one. How's that working out for you? I, I tell you, I love it because I realise there's so much of all these things. I mean, we we had a, a more of a list of things to get through, but it's so good to delve deep into things and unpack. Um, we'll do another one if you want. I love these conversations because yeah. it can be helpful to people, right? Actually, I, I think especially for us to, um, you know, guys resonating with the message we're putting across through the Whole Man Academy about, you know, not being offended by what other people say and your, you know, someone else's opinion of you is none of your business, things like that, to just change mm. the way they're thinking about how yeah. they're going through life. But they are cliches, aren't they? Mm. The, that's a ni They're nice ideas not reacting to how other people behave towards you. Mm. Um, or if you do react or maybe overreact, you, you, you see it later down the road and you become more humble, a bit of humility. You might apologize. Sorry, I was just lost in thought. I lost my rag a minute. I, I, was, you know, I got carried away. Whereas you tend to find that people that don't have an understanding, well, they'll be forever triggered by the outside world and they'll never find peace of mind. They'll never be calm mm. ever. So it's a nice idea to control your state when someone speaks to you in a way that gives you the energy of wanting to punch them in the face. Mm. <laughs> but it's that energy isn't coming from them. Yeah. If you can just see that this one call, just see that your anger, rage, insecurity, annoyance, judgment, that feeling, is connected to just your thinking, nothing else. Mm -hmm. Even though it really looks like the other people have wound you up. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. It's that so liberating, Anthony. It yeah, really well, is. That's what I was going to say is I think when you get it, and I know, you know, I had a light bulb moment years ago when I realized mm. that basically it was up to me how I feel and mm. you know how your thoughts coming in. You can't control them, but you control how you react to them and stuff. And it seems so simple once I got it, um, and it and it transformed my life and how I react to kids issues mm. what have you and I'm like you'd be amazed how much more stuff I can cope with if you could want to call it that now yeah. than yeah. before because I have that understanding but I, I have you to thank for that basically hey, you're welcome mate and um, you know here's the thing anybody who really understands this and really generally has an insight and goes oh my god yeah my feelings are coming from what I'm thinking nothing to do with what she said or he said or they did generally see it not intellectualize what we've said on this call but actually see it in real time you get an angry feeling and having the understanding isn't going to stop you getting pissed off it's not going to stop you being human 
Mm -hmm. what it does seem to do it creates lag time between the feeling that you have of rage or pissed offness or whatever word you want to put and acting your behavior so behavior feeling thinking that's it that's all you need to know it's enough to get you through the rest of your life mm -hmm. if you generally know what i'm pointing to is truth and not a concept it's not a technique it's not a strategy it's just the nature of how the mind works and the transient nature of thought is the most uh what's the word underestimated mm. part of the human experience and thoughts create things I think it's, a good, it's a good one to finish on as a reminder for guys that there's always work to be done on your own mindset and and, and how it can affect you know the people around yeah. you as well uh, now, Dave, how can people get hold of you if they're interested in uh, exploring more about what you do? What's the best right. way? Uh, DavidKey.com. Yep. Um, this book, Joyride. Joyride, three principles. Joyride. Um, infinite potential. So Joyride, one life, three principles, infinite potential. You can read that. Um, DavidKey.com. There is a contact us page. If you want to reach out to me, you can... Go to contact us and log a ticket. My support team get it, and then I'll get the message. Um, watch out on Facebook. We're doing a lot of promos at the moment for other courses. So. Yeah, well, I'll put the um, I'll put your website and stuff on the show notes, so it makes it. Cheers, uh, I know there's that. Um, I said it on the previous podcast, a, a guy who does branding that I know said there's a good good book called Don't Make Me Think, um, yeah. which is you know just 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 make it simple for people to follow or to connect or something yeah. like that. So I'll put that on there. Um, yeah, and I have uh, programs people can do if they're interested. I've got group programs and I do one-to-one -one work. Uh, not so much because, um, you know, I've got a full schedule with other things. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, yeah, I do work with some individuals who, yeah. who are suffering. Well, it won't be the last time, I'm sure, for the guys that follow the whole Man Academy that you hear from Dave. Uh, yeah, and I'd love to. We'll, we'll hopefully do together. I, um, doing I, fantastic. I will let you go and I will speak Thanks to you soon. Thanks, Thanks, Dave. Take care. Thanks for listening. Remember to sign up to our game-changing weekly e-letter that's read by men around the world. Sign up at wholemanacademy.com forward slash movement. Until next time.